Okay, let's get started our second session. Francisco Arana Herrera will tell us about talking closed G physics on hyperbolic surfaces. Yeah, so thanks for the introduction. And maybe let me also take the chance to thank the organizers for this. I think it's a great opportunity for uh, us, the postdocs, to talk about the things we're interested in share uh, what we want to work on. But without further ado, um, I'm going to be talking about certain conic problems for geodesics on hyperbolic surfaces. And just to sort of kickstart the talk, I want to go back to perhaps the most famous one, um, which is the uh, prime geodesic theorem. So if you have not seen it, I will describe it here very quickly. And if you have seen it, I'll just, uh, it'll be a quick reminder. So maybe let me start here. So um, I want to consider a hyperbolic surface. I'm going to put set, some adjectives on it for simplicity, but I'm going to say closed um, connected. Please let me know if my handwriting is too small. Uh, oriented, uh, let's say hyperbolic surface. Yeah, let's see a genus two surface with some hyperbolic metric. And uh, on this surface, I'm going to be interested on the uh, on how many closed GD six I can find that have. Uh, a certain bound on their length. So let me give that a name. I'm going to call that PXL, and that's going to be the number of, uh, I'm going to put a, an adjective here, primitive, uh, close GD6, uh, GD6 on the surface X, which have uh, length bounded by uh, this parameter L. Yeah, the word primitive here means what you expect. Uh, you don't want to double count GD6 that go over themselves twice. Um, you just count that as one. Um, well, that's what primitive means. And so if I give you a hyperbolic surface, I want you to tell me roughly uh, how this number is changing as you let the parameter uh, get bigger and bigger. Yeah. So uh, I don't know, let me draw one GD6 here. Maybe you start seeing. Uh, more and more GD6, and they could intersect. They could not. Uh, I have no uh, other uh, requirement for counting them. And the famous theorem of, uh, I guess I should mention, uh, Haber in 56. And uh, I also want to mention Margulis because I think it's uh, important as well, even if it's much later. Um, what the theorem says is it gives a complete description of this uh, counting function. I mean, complete, quote unquote, it gives a very good description. Uh, so it tells you that uh, this counting function has a leading term, which uh, is given by a logarithmic integral, which I'm going to write here and describe very briefly. So this is just the function where you integrate, say, from 2 to x, uh, log 1 over log t. And if you want, this behaves asymptotically like uh, x over log x, just to give you a rough idea. So what the theorem says is that your uh, leading behavior is like this logarithmic integral, and then there's an error term, which uh, has a gap with respect to that leading term. Yeah, and here the gap depends on uh, the geometry of the surface. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, this is a very classic result. If you want, it's an analog of uh, the prime number theorem, just in this geometric context. Instead of counting prime, prime numbers, we count uh, primitive or prime uh, close to these six. And then the result gives us a description of how that is growing with a leading term uh, given by this integral and then an error term which has a gap with respect to the uh, leading term. Yep, that's sort of the classic setting. Uh, what I want to do now is uh, move into a more specific setting. So what I would like to do is, so here you have a counting problem where I'm counting all primitive closed GD6. And what I would like to do is sort of be a bit more specific, put an adjective in front of them that's not just primitive, but ask something about their topology. Yep. So for instance, I could say, well, why don't we count only those that are simple? That would be an example. Why don't we count all of those that have three self-intersections, four self-intersections, or so on? That's sort of, sort of roughly the idea, but let me explain a way of uh, giving an adjective to this uh, GD6 that we want to count that's uh, pretty specific. So let me define for you the notion of topological type. Uh, so let me write it here. So uh, we're going to say that two closed curves 
gamma one and gamma two on a surface S have the same topological type. If I can find um, I can find a homeomorphism, so homeomorphism of the surface, so this is going to be a homeom, um, which takes the first curve to a curve that's free homotopic to the second. Yep. So that's sort of a technical definition, but let me maybe say what <laughs> What that means in our mind, it just means that up to wiggling, both curves cut the surface into the same pattern. Yep, if you cut along them. So maybe let's draw some different topological types just to exemplify. So uh, all of them are going to be, be behaving quite differently. So the first thing that I want to draw is um, a non separating simple closed curve. So here you have a curve which doesn't separate the surface, and it's simple. So that would be specifying one topological type, the topological type such that when you cut along it, you get a genus one surface with two boundary components. That's one example. Um, let me draw now one with one intersection just to uh, be sufficiently general. So here you have this curve, which uh, has an intersection in front and wraps around the back. And uh, that's a different topological type. But now I want to draw something that's sort of the more generic situation. And for this, I need my reference picture because uh, it's not entirely easy to draw, although it's generic. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so here you have a, uh, a curve which has many intersections and sort of wraps around the surface in different cases. And it's sort of on the opposite extreme of this one. So here you have a curve which is simple. And here you have a curve which we call feeling. So feeling uh, means that uh, if you give me any other loop on the surface, you cannot avoid this blue curve, even if you're allowed to wiggle. Yeah, Even up to uh, free homotopy, you can never avoid uh, uh, intersecting that blue curve there. And so you have these many different families. Uh, I mean, this is just one topological type among all feeling uh, curves. So if you want to shoot right, belongs to the class of feeling curves, and that one belongs to the class of simple curves. But what I do want to highlight is that among all of these situations, the one that it's generic is not this one, but it's rather this one. Yeah, so this is the generic case. In a sense that uh, I won't make it slightly precise, but just to say, one way, if you pick a random, um, if you pick a long GDC at random, uh, it will generically uh, cut the surface like this. So it will generically cut the surface into disks. Yep, that's the situation. Yep. And so with that said, I can state uh, the uh, more specific version of uh, the theorem I wanted to mention. So, uh, let me write it here. So again, the context is going to be pretty similar. X is just going to be a hyperbolic surface with all the adjectives from above. So Mogulis allowed variable negative curvature, you constant curvature. Uh, yeah, for the theorem that I'm going to say, it actually works for variable negative curvature. But I'm just restricting to hyperbolic for, for the moment. Yep. So uh, X is going to be a hyperbolic surface. Let me just specify the genus because it's going to show up in the result. Uh, and I'm going to fix also a closed curve on X. And what this closed curve is going to do, it's going to specify the topological type that I care about, the one that I want to count. And so in line with what I've been saying, what I should be counting now is the following function with a C. Uh, it's all closed uh, GD6. <laughs> the same uh, topological type as gamma. Uh, as gamma, and which also have length bounded by L. You don't require primitive anymore? Mm -hmm. require yeah, I don't require primitive, because that will already be sort of encoded in the type that I pick. If I pick a closed curve that it's primitive, this will already uh, encode that. Um, 
But if I want, I can pick one that's not predicted. Um, yeah. And so uh, now I count fixing a topological type and asking the length. And then the question is again the same. How does this function grow as we take the parameter or the threshold L going to infinity or large? And then the theorem, uh, yeah, maybe I want to write it here. Um, so I want to mention two theorems. I want to begin with, uh, I'll mention them both here. So let me begin with the theorem of uh, SP Mursahani and Muhammad. from 2019. So uh, what the theorem says is that in the case where the curve gamma that specifies the type is simple, uh, then we know how this function grows like. So in that case, uh, this function C x gamma L uh, has a leading term, which looks like L to the 60 minus six, and has an error term with respect to which uh, there's, uh, there's a gap on this error term. So maybe let me say, I'll write it here, where uh, the leading term, the C, um, is constantly in front, depends on both the geometry of the surface and the type of the curve, and where the gap kappa uh, depends rather surprisingly only on the genus. Yep. So this is the result of asking Mirzahani Muhammadi, the original result without an error term, just an asymptotic estimate goes back to uh, Mariam's thesis, but this is a much more uh, recent version that took uh, 15 years of very hard work. And uh, so this is a very nice theorem, but uh, it works exclusively on the simple case. So it works on this side here, which is uh, rather non-generic. Uh, even from what's written on the board, um, it's not so hard to show that there are finitely many topological types of simple closed curves. In this case, you have two, those that are not separating and those that are separating, which I haven't drawn there. Um, but you have finitely many types, and each one exhibits polynomial growth, while the primitive geodesic theorem tells you that among all, if you were to count all closed geodesics, not all the simple ones, you would witness uh, exponential growth. So you can see that this is sort of uh, a rather uh, particular situation. But the theorem that I want to mention and this is uh, work of myself. I guess I finished it this year, but um, it says that if gamma is filling, so if we're in the generic case, gamma is filling, that sort of the generic situation, um, and the same estimate, then same type of estimate holds. That depends. The implied constant depends on. Can you repeat that? Yeah, the the constant that's in front of the leading term depends yes. on the geometry and the it curve. The and the gap on the error term uh, depends only on the genus, but the constant in front does depend on the surface and the type that you. That's looking. very different in the other case where, because the exponent depends on the smallest. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's quite different. Uh, I don't have a good explanation of why that's happening. I mean, through it's sort of embedded in the techniques of these results, but but it's uh, I don't know exactly why uh, a better reason of why it's happening. I mean, is there some gap for the Tagmula flow that's in, in both here? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna mention. And is that so? That's probably uniform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, is this in type of estimate? So again, L is G minus six or just putting Yeah, L yeah. So the same, exactly the same thing, but you're here allowed to change the word simple for filling. Do you expect a sort of more precise thing with the lower order term? Um, yeah, it's hard to tell. It seems like this is as far as you can push the techniques, uh, but even aside from that, uh, I don't know if you can get any sort of expansion. Uh, it's kind of, it's very hard to even get to this point. So I wouldn't be able to say off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And you get the same type of estimate. Yeah, that's what the theorem says. And uh, I guess, let me see if I have some time. Yeah, I guess I have one minute. I'll just say, uh, I'll write here. Let me just write a quick upshot of the proof of this uh, and be related to Peter's question. Um, Obviously, I won't have time to approve, but let me just say one word, which is that uh, a sort of sensible way to try to prove these things is uh, the following. So you have this counting problem for GD6, which seems sort of a very discrete uh, <laughs> weird place to be working on. 
but you can sort of leverage from that and you can try to communicate uh, with, uh, quote unquote, but it's very explicit, with a space uh, with dynamics. And sort of go on from there. Uh, the space here is a uh, Tegmiller space. And what I mean by rich dynamics is several different words, uh, but let me just mention one, which is perhaps the most important, is the presence of a nice exponentially mixing flow. And to finish, uh, let me just say that as Pierre was mentioning, uh, the gap here uh, depends on many things, but among them, it depends on this rate of mixing, which uh, is given by certain spectral gap on the Miller space. And that's, um, that's how, that's in some way why uh, you should expect if I tell you that about the proof that this gap should depend only on the G. Yep, and I think I'll finish there. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, to begin with mm -hmm. what kind of geometry makes k, the k of x to be very small? Uh, it depends on the um, smallest non zero eigenvalue of mm -hmm. the Laplacian of x. So uh, the closer that is uh, to zero, the worse your uh, error term. And it means it has, it's close to the boundary with a long neck? Depends how you degenerate, but there is a degeneration which has exactly that. Uh -huh. Almost some of them. Yeah. Maybe it's a stupid question, but uh, are there curves that don't have a uh, topological type uh, geodesic? Uh, can, you draw, can you draw some weird looking curve that you cannot homomorphic? Uh, yeah, the, the point is that in the definition, I embedded that free homotopy uh, part. So uh, if you give me any curve, you, it's geodesic representative with respect to the metric, we'll have the same topological type <coughs> of that part. Mm -hmm. I vaguely remember that that constant in front somehow is an interesting function. Isn't it? Yeah, so this constant in front, uh, it depends on the setting, but it always breaks up into this constant C of X comma gamma. You can always show, show that it breaks up multiplicatively into something which depends on exclusively the surface and something that depends on uh, gamma. This constant measures sort of the level of degeneracy of the surface. So if the surface has short loops, the, uh, this constant tends to be very large. And uh, this is um, a rational number that you can sort of compute if you have a nice computer. <laughs> Uh, there's an algorithm for computing it, even in the, although it's not been done, you can even do it in the case where you have self intersections, it's just some sort of smoothing procedure. Is the rich dynamics the like Peterson flow or something? No, the rich dynamics is a Tick Miller geodesic flow, so that's not, uh, doesn't come from the Tick Miller uh, geodesic flow. And um, doesn't come from a metric that's Riemannian. The metric is insular and it has some, it has like a very nice geometric meaning, but it's not uh, the Peterson. Yep. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. What about the middle case? That's either simple or. Yeah, so that's a very good question. What about the middle case? Uh, <laughs> from these two results, I would guess that it holds, but uh, neither the original result nor these methods directly can tackle it. I think you should be able to adapt uh, what I did in the feeling case to work in that setting, but there's uh, a lot of technicalities that show up uh, when you're not feeling, and they're related to a lot of things, but I guess perhaps I can say the word that there's a lot of stabilization when you're uh, not feeling, and that can sort of turn a lot of aspects of your proof into something way more technical. Okay, let's thank Francisco.